Good afternoon. While the pastor is away, we have are circulating a uh, pastor appreciation card for uh, next month. Uh, but we use the opportunity while he's going to circulate it today. Where is the card now? It's, it's, all right. Yeah. So once it gets down to that side, I'll pass it across the aisle and keep it keep it going. You have you have my permission to not pay attention to me for a little bit while, <laughs> while you think of what to sign in the card. <clears throat> We also have a, uh, for the book club, uh, Janet has uh, prepared, Janet Shea has prepared a little uh, guide for reading the first couple chapters. I don't know how far we're going to get, but we'll just, she's got some questions there that, uh, things to think about on the first couple of chapters, and uh, that will, will get us uh, started. We'll see how it goes. A few months ago, I talked about the spiritual gifts chapter, 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, in that chapter, Paul is addressing a problem in the church at Corinth. It seems that some of the Corinthians had a certain spiritual gift. And they thought it made them better than other Christians. And anyone who didn't have that gift was in some way inferior. Paul says, no, that's not so. Uh, we can't expect everybody in the church to have the same gift because the Holy Spirit distributes the gifts so that we have to work together. Just like a human body needs eyes and ears, uh, different members of the body with diff different abilities, so it is with the body of Christ, the church. We have different skills, abilities, uh, and some of them are more visible than others. Uh, nobody has all the gifts. That means we are all lacking something. Uh, and we need the help of other people in the church to balance, balance us out, and we need to work together. We can't expect everybody to have the same gift, nor should we think that one person in one particular gift makes a person better than the others. Uh, after all, it is a gift, and there's no point in bragging about what we've been given. Uh, one gift might be better than another in certain situations, uh, but the gift itself isn't necessarily better. However, for each gift, there is a, a better way to use it. There's a wrong way and a better way. And the best way is to use it for its intended purpose. Paul tells us what that purpose is in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Uh, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. No matter what the gift is, God gives it to help the church as a whole uh, for the common good, uh, to help each person within the church. So if we're using the gift to exalt ourselves, make ourselves look good, it's a poor use of the gift. And if we're using it to help the church, then it's a better use of the gift. We're acting in accordance with the purpose of the gift. Now today I'd like to pick up the discussion where I left off in May. Uh, we'll start in verse 27. This paragraph is kind of a summary of what Paul has already written in the chapter, so we can go through it quickly, starting in verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ, that's the church, and each uh, one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, guidance, different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? And the Greek grammar here implies that the answer is no. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Do all work miracles? No. Do all have gifts of hearing? No. Do all speak in tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. Now, he says in verse 31, eagerly desire the greater gifts. Now God has placed, uh, you know, spiritual gifts in the church by scattering them around. Not everyone can be an apostle. Not everyone can work miracles. Not everyone can interpret tongues. That's okay. We don't all have to be exactly alike in those skills and abilities. But we can notice a couple of things from verse 31. First, it is okay to desire a particular gift. If you want the gift of guidance, it's okay to ask for it. You might not get it, but it's okay to ask. <laughs> uh, 
And second, some gifts are greater than others. Some gifts are better for the common good. Uh, and it's those gifts that we are to eagerly desire. If we want the gift of guidance to make ourselves look important, well, that's the wrong reason. God's not likely to answer a request like that. But if we want it to help others, then maybe he will. And we have a third, Paul also says, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. Um, there's a better way to go about it. And then in the next verse, chapter 13, is the love chapter. The most excellent way is love. Now, Paul doesn't say that love is a spiritual gift. It's different in a couple of respects. First, Paul expects every Christian to be able to act in love. Uh, he didn't ask the question like he did for the other spiritual, these other spiritual gifts. Uh, is everyone supposed to act in love? Uh, well, <laughs> the answer there would be yes. Uh, he would not say that the Holy Spirit had distributed love to some people but not to others. Uh, love is in a different category. It's not a spiritual gift, but rather it's the way in which all spiritual gifts should be used. In a different letter, Paul says that love is part of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness. These things should be in every believer's life. Uh, they're not scattered around. Although, each of us tends to be a little better in some categories than others. Uh, they should all, we should all have love. These are descriptions of what God is like, of what he wants all of us to be like. He, he wants all of us to have love and to use our gifts in love for one another. Or we could use a different analogy. Spiritual gifts are like the icing on the cake. Decorations that make it look better, taste better, but love is the cake. <laughs> it's what Christian life is. So here in verse 31, Paul is saying, yeah, some gifts are, okay, are better than others, and it's okay to desire the greater gifts, but now I'm going to show you something that's even more important than that. That's the way of love. All those spiritual gifts I've talked about are to be evaluated from the perspective of love. Whether you think you have a special aptitude for love or not, you're supposed to be doing everything in love. That's the more excellent way. So that's why I titled my message today, Be the Best You Can Be. Paul is saying that this is something you should desire. We should want to do it. It's the best thing possible. It's the best thing for the church, the best thing for our relationships, the best thing for whatever spiritual gift we might have, and it's the best thing for us. Paul would want each of us to be the best that we can be. In this case, our being is in the doing. Uh, we, who we are is reflected in what we do. Let's see how he, he describes it in chapter 13, starting verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And tongues happen to be a favorite, one of the favorite gifts in Corinth. But Paul was saying, I don't care whether your speech is a foreign language or even if it's an angelic language. If you aren't using it in love, hey, you're just making noise. You're not using it for the purpose for which it was given. And in verse 2, Paul mentions a few other gifts. If I have the gift of prophecy, can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have a, a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. It doesn't matter how spectacular your gift might be. If you're lacking in love, all those gifts aren't doing you or anybody else any good. You're drawing attention to yourself, but it's pointless. Verse 3 gives another example. If I give all I possess to the poor, give over my body to hardship, that I might boast, but don't have love, I gain nothing. You know, normally giving to the poor is an act of love. But if we're doing it to boast about how great we are, then we don't gain anything. 
Jesus talked about people who blew a trumpet when they gave to the poor, trying to get everyone to see how wonderful they were. And he said, that's pointless. Uh, it probably helps some poor people that might even fool some of the onlookers. Uh, but it really doesn't carry much weight with God. If you're seeking public acclaim, you might get it. But that's all it is, and it'll soon go away. If we're willing to suffer, that might seem like a great demonstration of how much faith we have. But if all we're doing it is to demonstrate our faith, you know, trying to get other people to think that we're wonderful, uh, then that kind of action doesn't help us uh, much either. If it's not done for the right reason, it might as well not be done. Paul says you got to have love. Nothing is worth doing unless it's done in love. So we read in verses 4 and 5, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Now, I don't feel particularly competent to comment on all these things. I try to do these things, but I haven't progressed much beyond this description into any more profound description of what love does. But I will note one thing, that Paul doesn't say that love is a feeling. And he wants us to do these things whether we feel like it or not. Love is a commitment. A commitment to keep doing the right thing no matter how we feel. These verses are often read at weddings. I, I suppose that's appropriate. They're a nice bit of poetic writing. And people at a wedding are ready to think about what love is. But Paul's not talking about a wedding. He's talking about church. About relationships with people who aren't perfect. He's talking about what we do with people that at least some of them we don't like to spend a lot of time with. Uh, there's no point in being patient when everything is going our way. We need patience when things are not going right. We need to avoid envy, even if other people do have things or talents that we'd like to have. There's always going to be somebody who's got more or whatever it is that we want. Most of this description so far is negative. Love doesn't do this bad thing. Love doesn't do that bad thing. But I think we could turn those things around, too and say not just that love doesn't dishonor other people, but we can say that love honors others, respects others, seeks what is good for others, and looks for good in others. That's basically what we want others to do for us, <laughs> to give us the benefit of the doubt, to be considerate of our needs, to forgive our mistakes. We can read these verses... Uh, Frequently, and we can put our own name there, asking whether it's true. Am I patient? Am I kind? Or, in a particular situation, what kind of response is going to be kind? Am I holding a grudge? Am I still keeping count of how many wrong things that person did? How can I give honor to the other person? We all have room for growth there. We can also put in the name of Jesus. He's the definition of love. We can say he's patient, he's kind, he's not easily angered. But we do read in the Gospels that Jesus was sometimes angry. He did have some criticisms of the Pharisees. And we can see that love is not quite as simple as we might have first thought. We can't take our ideas about love and uh, even these few verses and say that this is the way that God ought to be. No, we need to allow God to give a more complete description of what love is and what we ought to be. Verse 6, Paul, Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Uh, I think, for example, uh, of the situation that Paul described earlier, chapter 5 of this letter, there was some man in the church who was having sex with his stepmother, and you know, some people in the congregation were supportive of it. And they might have said that the loving thing to do was to be patient and kind and 
keep no record of wrongs. But Paul would say, sorry folks, that's not love. It's lust for something that God has forbidden. It's pride. It's self-seeking. Love does not mean that we humans get to redefine what's good and evil. Uh, love doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Not the truth as you want it to be, but the truth as God reveals that it is. We love God first, and then he tells us how to love our neighbors. We listen to him, because he's a lot smarter than we are. This chapter in Corinthians is called the love chapter because it's about love, but it's not a complete description of what love is. We have to look at other passages too to see how it works out in different situations. We can't just pick and choose one chapter and ignore the others. But for today, we'll stick in this chapter and see what it says. Verse 7, love always protects, always trusts, always hopes always perseveres. These are virtues that come with love. But again, they can be overdone. Uh, the Catholic Church in Philadelphia has been in the news recently uh, for covering up sexual sins of the priests. They were protecting the wrong people, trusting the wrong people, and their hope for improvement was unrealistic. Uh, they might have said that they were trying to be loving toward the priests who sinned, but in doing so, they weren't protecting the people they were supposed to protect. They might have said that their policy was based on love, but it seems more likely to be based on selfishness. They were protecting their buddies, their own power, their privileges. People can be pretty clever in how they describe their own ideas as love. Uh, but it isn't necessarily so. In verse 8, Paul says, love never fails. That's true in several ways. It, it always works. It's never the wrong approach to take. It never quits. Uh, but here in verse 8, the meaning seems to be that there will never come a time when love won't be needed. As he says in this verse, that where, where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. There will come a time when we don't need prophecies anymore. There will come a time when tongues won't be needed. We won't need special words of knowledge. Because after the resurrection, we'll all have the knowledge we all need. Uh, I don't think there will ever come a time when we stop learning. Because uh, we'll be finite limited beings in an unlimited universe. There will always be more to learn about God and what he's doing. There will always be a need for love. God is love. He's always been love and will forever be love. And he is inviting us into a life of love that never ends. Love will always be the basic description of life, of what it is, the way we interact with one another. Verse, in verses 9 and 10. We know in part, we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When Christ returns and uh, we are resurrected into glory, these partial understandings that we currently have will be eclipsed, uh, just like the light of a candle. It's pretty hard to see when it's in full sunlight. Paul gives an analogy in verse 11. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. He doesn't develop the analogy, but the meaning seems to be that we will have a distinctly different level of understanding when completeness comes, when Christ returns, when we are brought to the glory that God has designed for us. And just like a small child needs to learn a language, learns how to come to sensible conclusions, that's where we are now. Our understanding now is partial. And it will become complete when Christ returns. I was thinking of 
this kind of example, just as, as Portia and Maddox came in. Maddox wanted her attention. Uh, Maddox wanted love. That's great. But he wasn't understanding of how to express love when Portia was already carrying a baby on one side and Maddox wanted to be on the other. Uh, that's it. not being considered. Uh, but in, in the same way, we are not always aware of how to express the love that we would like to. We'll, we'll grow in leaps and bounds uh, in our ability to understand and our ability to express love. Now Paul's point in this chapter is that various spiritual gifts won't be needed anymore. But there will always be a need for love. Uh, it will never go out of style, never be eclipsed. Uh, we might be, it might be intensified as we learn more about what love is. Uh, our understanding is partial now. It will grow more and more in the next life. Verse 12 develops it with another analogy. Now we see only a reflection in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I will know fully, even as I am fully known. The mirrors they had back then were polished brass, and they gave a decent but somewhat dim reflection, and sometimes with a few distortions. Uh, our current level of understanding is a bit like that. But in the future, we're going to see clearly nothing between us and what we're looking at. No distortion, no dimming. Now, these are not precise estimates of how much our understanding is going to grow. Uh, Paul doesn't know, I don't know, nobody knows how much we don't know. <laughs> but we are convinced that our current understanding is partial and it will be complete in the future. We will know fully, like God knows us fully. Our level of understanding will be more like he is. And that's a huge leap forward. And he summarizes in verse 13. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. These are the three primary Christian virtues. Faith for today, hope for tomorrow, love for all times. All three are important, but the most important is love. Now Paul has not forgotten about the topic of spiritual gifts. This chapter on love wasn't a random digression. It wasn't placed here by accident. Paul is saying that love is the lens through which we need to look at spiritual gifts. How can we figure out what spiritual gift is best for us, is best for the occasion? Love is the measuring stick that we need. Even if we can work all sorts of miracles, like you said earlier, if we don't have love, it's all for naught. How did that apply in ancient Corinth? There, the people had a wide variety of spiritual gifts, and apparently there was a desire for tongue speaking in particular. So at the end of chapter 12, Paul says, earnestly desire the greatest gifts. Now, you desire great gifts, and that's, that's good. Earnestly desire the greatest gifts. And after this discussion of love, he tells them in chapter 14, verse 1, Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit. And you got that part right. But then he says, especially prophecy. It's not that tongues are bad and ought to be outlawed. No. Tongues is a legit legitimate gift. It's got legitimate uses. But Paul is telling the people that if they're going to seek a particular gift, it would be more helpful for everybody if they tried to give, get the gift of prophecy. So in this chapter, he's going to compare tongues and prophecy to show why prophecy is the better gift. But we can't understand the discussion if we don't know what prophecy is. Uh, there are times in the New Testament when prophecy means to predict the future. That's usually what comes to mind when, for people today when they hear the word prophecy. But almost all scholars agree that Paul isn't talking about predicting the future here. That would be a handy gift to have. You know, if you could predict the future, you could make a killing on the stock market. 
Uh, and you can save lots of uh, li uh, lives by telling people in advance where the natural disaster was going to strike. Uh, but God doesn't seem to be inspiring that kind of prophecy right now. So what is Paul talking about? Our first clue comes in verse 3. Let's skip to verse 3. But one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Prophecy helps make people stronger in the faith. It encourages, it comforts. And verse 6 gives us another clue. Paul says, Brothers and sisters, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? So here it seems that prophecy is something similar to revelation, knowledge, and instruction. There's no suggestion there that anybody's predicting the future. Paul gives us a little more to work on in verse 24. But if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin and are brought under judgment by all. Prophecy is something that might convict somebody of sin. Another description comes in verse 31. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. Prophecy gives instruction and encouragement. It builds people up. It gives comfort when that's needed, conviction when that's needed. Many commentators say that the modern equivalent is preaching. That's the kind of speaking that teaches people, encourages people, convicts them that they ought to change their ways. Some scholars say it needs to be a spontaneous revelation, and apparently sometimes it is, but there's no reason that all instances of prophecy have to be sudden flashes of inspiration. God can inspire study and preparation just as well as spontaneity. And it seems in our own experience, speaking is generally more useful if some study and preparation has gone into it. So Paul is saying, if you want a spiritual gift, I encourage you to seek the gift of preaching. Join speech club. <laughs> Learn how to speak in public. Some people seem to have the gift of gab and speak easily, but preaching is a lot more than the gift of gab. There needs to be substance to it as well based on the Word of God. It needs to be presented in a way that helps people understand and believe. Now, preaching isn't for everyone. Not everyone needs that particular gift. If you want a different gift, that's okay. You can ask God for that. But if you're not sure of what you want to do to help others, Paul recommends the gift of preaching. Speaking with words that can be understood. And that's the contrast he makes in verse 2. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries of the Spirit. So that, that's Paul's description of speaking in tongues. Whether they're foreign languages or something else, it, it doesn't matter. Paul says nobody understands them. Uh, they're not gibberish. They are a way of speaking to God. Some people call them a prayer language. Paul's point is that nobody else can understand it. Uh, in contrast, Verse 3, but the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. And verse 4 summarizes the difference. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves. But the one who prophesies edifies the church. It's not wrong to edify yourself. Presumably that makes you a stronger Christian of greater value to the church. But that can be done at home. Paul is saying that the church isn't helped much by hearing you speak words they don't understand. Even if the words help you, they aren't helping anybody else. But if we preach in words that others can understand, it edifies the church and it helps build it up and make us stronger. Verse 5 then summarizes, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. It's a good thing to do, even if not everybody can do it. But I would rather 
I'd say more important, to have you prophesy. That spiritual gifts help, helps everyone. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets. So the church may be edified. Paul keeps going back to edifying. That's the purpose of the church, meeting together. As he says later, everything must be done so that the church may be built up. <laughs> and we'll talk more about that another day. I want to leave you with two thoughts. First, from the last verse in chapter 12, eagerly desire the greater gifts. Do you desire to help the church? Do you want God to work through you for this purpose? If so, we need to desire gifts and greater ones. How do we know which gifts are greater? It's by what verse 31 calls the most excellent way. The way of love. If love is the standard by which everything is to be judged, we need to seek gifts that help us help others. If we want to speak, it's best to speak with words that others can understand, with words that instruct and convict and comfort and build others up. What is the best that you can be? Father, we do thank you for giving us uh, your love, that you sh invite us to share in that. That is such a remarkable thing, uh, that you care about us, and that you share that. And you share bits of yourself with us and our spiritual gifts, too. Help us use what you have given uh, and the purpose for which you've given it. Almighty. We're going to be living with each other forever and ever. Help us learn to do it better now. In Jesus' name, amen.